Keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing a wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Neil at the cross, 74, everybody sing with us. I ain't too bad right now, but it does get sometimes. It was 78 or whatever. Yeah. Well, there I used to be it. four of us doing this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there used to sure. be the rifle range quartet. None of us live on rifle range anymore. <laughs> no. But uh, William, uh, before he passed away, we, we thought about changing the name of to the Goatees. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that'd still be relevant. Yep, I wonder yep. why. The, well, maybe the three goatees. The three goatees, yeah. <laughs> three, okay. How about three old goats? <laughs> that's, that's exactly what that, I said. That's probably what more they were saying. <laughs> right. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come while he waits for you. List to his voice. Leave with him your care. And begin life anew. Kneel at the cross, at the cross. Leave, every care, every care. leave every care, every care, kneel at the cross, at the cross. Jesus will meet you there, kneel at the cross, there is room for all who his glory share. Bliss there awaits, harm can there befall those who are anchored there. Kneel at the cross, at the cross, at the cross. leave every care, every care, every care. Kneel at the cross, at the cross. Give your idols up, look unto realms above. Turn not away to life's sparkling cup, trust only in his love. Kneel at the cross, at the cross, at the cross. Leave every cave, every cave, every care. Kneel at the cross, at the cross, Jesus will meet you there. Amen. You kids got a song you want to sing? Well, come on up then. leader of this here band? Me. I, I thought Brody might say he was. Now, uh, Allie's the tallest, so maybe she'll be it. No, nope, not, might not be, Might not be very much longer. All right. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. But there ain't no way you'll ever let me down. 
Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs Tell me, is he good? He's good. Tell me, is he God? He's God. He is good God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever, that your mercy never stops. So why should I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? Like, like the sun in the morning, I know you're going to be there every day. So what on earth could make me feel afraid? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs Tell me, is he good? He's good. Tell me, is he God? He's God. He is good God Almighty. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning. Love him in the noontime. Love him when the sun goes down. Thank you, kids. I guess kids can go on down. Somebody's going down with them. Anybody else got a song they want to sing? You got one, Dexter? You don't have one. Huh? I got to do a half an hour talking here. It's been a real long time for Buddy. Buddy, somebody suggested that you get up and sing one. Well, he'll, I'll get him here in a minute. Buddy. Somebody suggest, hey Buddy Wilson, somebody suggested you get up and sing a song. I bet you, I bet you sing all the time at home. <laughs> yeah. Not even asking. Larry's trying to get Buddy to give up all his knowledge to him, and Larry, and Buddy just won't do it. You don't want Larry to know as much as he knows. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you got one you want to sing, Dale, or not? No, I'm good. We got time if you guys want to. We can start, then. We can start. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about prayer here for uh, a minute a minute here, and uh, specifically we'll get to the Lord's Prayer at some point, but I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 verse 5, Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. Now in the Bible, well, yes. Uh, keep the Dixon family in your prayers then if you can. And I said turn over to Matthew chapter 6 verse 5 in the Bible the, which is of course we know as the holy word of God we read about prayer and we read quite a bit about prayer about the different things about prayer and when it came time uh, near or near the time uh, for Jesus Christ to be given over to those that would of course uh, shame him beat him and then uh, crucify him he, he moved himself, he placed himself, as the Bible says, about a stone's throw away from the, uh, the, the disciples, the disciples, and uh, uh, he went to pray, he went to pray by himself, and he said this, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. So he asked that God's will be done. And the Bible says that an angel appeared unto him, appear, uh, uh, unto him that was strengthening him, strengthening him. And it goes on to say, and being in agony, he prayed uh, uh, more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I want to point out just a couple of things about that. It doesn't, uh, for one thing, uh, God did not remove that burden of the cross from him when he prayed that. 
But God did do something for him. He sent an angel. He sent an angel to comfort him, an angel to strengthen him. And, and the second thing is it doesn't really say that he sweated drops of blood. People will say that he sweated great drops of blood, but it says, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, that could be just that the sweat was much bigger the drops were much bigger and, and uh, uh, more prevalent than they would be or it could also be referring to a phenomenon known as a uh, hematidrosis where someone that is extremely extremely stressed and extremely an uh, uh, anxious about something when they sweat they'll have blood mixed in with that it, it could have been something like that that verse does say that he was in agony and he was in great agony no doubt uh, he prayed more earnestly well, you know when we when we uh, uh, are, are really, really uh, worried about something, when we really want something to be done, we'll ask more earnestly maybe than we will if it's just an, you know, a prayer that we might do uh, regularly. But Jesus also told the disciples, he said they went to sleep and he told them not to sleep but wake up. He said, and pray lest ye enter into temptation. Now, Jesus knew he wouldn't be there on earth with them to, to watch over them, and he was sad to leave them. He didn't want to leave them. He wanted them to, you know, he wanted them to, he wanted to equip them the best that he could before he left. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 says this, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. You know, he knew that uh, Peter was going to be a great preacher, didn't he? He knew Peter was going, people was going to get Peter was going to get people saved, and he didn't want that to happen. Uh, Though Satan will sift you as wheat, he'll he'll destroy you if he can. He'll destroy your testimony, your family, and everything that he can. We know that the Bible says that all that live godly will suffer persecution, and we know that uh, even if it's men doing that persecution, even men are the ones that are doing it. We know that Satan is behind it; that Satan led them to do it. The Apostle Paul. When he had said that he had been given a thorn in his side, he said it was a, a, a messenger uh, from Satan to buffet him. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure. And he said that he sought the Lord thrice, three times. He sought the Lord three times that it might depart from him. Now, of course, this was in prayer that he sought the Lord, that he spoke to God. But he said God told him this. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, how many of us, <clears throat> if we pray, if we pray to God and God were to tell us, my grace is sufficient. You don't even need this prayer answer. How many of us, how many of us would be satisfied with that answer? Can I tell you this, folks, and I've been there myself. We have, a, we have a, you know, sometimes we're disappointed. We're disappointed. We have a problem when we go to God in, in prayer about something and we're really, really stalwart about it. We really are earnest about it and, and, uh, and we don't get it, it answered. Sometimes we're disappointed by that when we get the results we didn't get the results that we wanted but of course it's, it's because we don't always remember this and we need to always remember that God's will be done that's what we need to do that's what we remember to do and then we need to abide by that remember that Jesus asked that this cup be removed from me if thy will be done but it wasn't God's will that that cup be removed was it it was God's will that Jesus Christ would lay down his life for those that were lost, for those that were sin, that, he, that were sinners, and uh, that, uh, that he would uh, save those by his sacrifice. That was what God's will was. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful not to let uh, Satan to influence us, to believe that Jesus don't care for us, that God doesn't care for us because he didn't answer our prayers. He doesn't always answer our prayers, or worse, you know, people might even lose their faith. They might even think that God don't exist because he doesn't answer the prayer in the way that they think he should answer the prayer or, when, or, or even when he should, he should do that. We have to think about it this way. Do we want to do God's will or do we want a God that will do our bidding? That wouldn't be much of a God, would it? If he would just do what we want him to do all the time, we don't, we don't, always, we don't always pray the way that we should. We can read in Luke 6, 12 that sometimes Jesus would go into a mountain apart from everybody else and the Bible says that he would continue all night long in prayer. Sometimes we think that if we do a 10 or 15, 20 second prayer at mealtime that we really accomplish something. Some people don't even do that. It's sad, isn't it? It's sad the way we neglect God and things of God. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was put into prison and he was put in there 
along with some of the disciples. He was put in there for preaching and talking about Jesus Christ. He had been warned not to speak of that name, not to even bring that name up. But he'd been put in prison for doing that. Acts 12, 5 says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. The Bible tells us to be consistent, not to give up, not to faint, but to pray like we ought to pray all the time and we just be consistent about it. God tells us to do certain things that will strengthen our prayer life. And James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now that explains right there where a lot of our prayers are not answered. We're not always righteous. I'm certainly not. We're not always what we should be. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 3.7, Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the, the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. But how many of us are the husbands that we should be or the wives that we should be? How many of us are? How many of us do all the things that we ought to do? When the disciples heard, that, heard Jesus pray after he got done praying, uh, one of them asked, the Bible says that one of them asked uh, that uh, he teach, he said, Lord, teach us to pray uh, as uh, John taught his disciples to pray. We know that we don't know how to pray as we ought to, but they asked God to preach them. And as, uh, uh, so Jesus, in two books of the Bible, Matthew and Mark, he lays down a, a model prayer, a prayer that you can follow to get an understanding of how they are to pray to God, the things that you are to ask for for God. There are certain things that we shouldn't ask for for God. You know, you ask for, for a new car if you've got a perfectly well-working car. You know, we do things like that, don't we? A new house. Hey, my neighbor got a new house. I need a new house. God, give me a new house. Uh, there was a song a long time ago, Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? You know, God ain't gonna, God ain't gonna answer prayers like that, is he? That's not the thing that God's, that God's at. That's not the things that he wants you to pray. But in Matthew, he began the prayer with some extra uh, beginning uh, of instructions. Matthew 6, 5 through 15 says this. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, uh, pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which is seeth in secret shall reward thee openly but when you pray use not vain repetitions as the heathen do for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking but be not ye therefore like unto them for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him after this manner therefore pray ye our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And he goes on to say this, For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if we forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive forgive your trespasses forgiveness is a big thing it's a hard thing sometimes come over in your bibles to romans chapter 8 uh, verse 16 romans 8 16 romans 8 16 romans 8 16 uh, my fingers are a little stiff this morning so so what we're going to do here for the next for the remaining of this sermon we're going to look at that sample we're look at that sample prayer that Jesus put forth for us and he begins he began by, he began that by saying our father which art in heaven but what gives us the right to call God our father what gives us that right we know that Jesus is God the son right so God's his father for sure we know this also that God called Israel my son so they have the right to call him their father in Ephesians, Paul is speaking to the uh, people of, of Ephesus, and he said this, Wherefore remember that ye be in, in, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision, that's the Jews, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, 
and without God in the world. So we were without God. We didn't have Christ. We had no part in Israel. We had no part in God. God was not our father at that time. But after we're saved, after we are saved then, we become part of that family of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, 8, 16, and 17 says this, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him, glorified with God. Go ahead and turn over to Exodus, over in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Exodus 27. So through Jesus Christ, we are made sons of God. We are made heirs of, of, with Jesus Christ. And we can call God our Father. And that's why we have that right to call God our Father. The second part of Jesus' prayer says, which art in heaven, which tells us that it's talking about our Father in heaven, right? Not our Father on earth. We can't pray to our Father on earth. We can't pray to any natural father. We can't pray to a priest that calls himself Father. We can't pr pray to anybody like that. It's our heavenly Father, our Father that's in heaven. And it says this, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Hallow means to be holy, to be sanctified. Uh, the only time that the word hallowed is used in the Bible, in, in the New Testament, it's two times, and that's in Matthew and Mark when it's talking about this prayer, this uh, model prayer. Uh, but then it's 35 times in the Old Testament, and almost every time it's used in there, it is, it's used in conjunction with the word holy. So holy and hallowed are very closely related, same things. We know that the Bible says that God is holy. He's a holy God. None like him. No one holy like him. We can be holy as saints, but we're not holy like God. God's without sin. He is holy above all others. Holy just means different or set apart. And God is different than any we can ever be. God's just so far above us. But let me ask you this. It said, hallowed be thy name. Does everybody hallow or make God's name holy? They should, but they don't, do they? They absolutely don't. Here in... Uh, uh, in, in Exodus chapter 20 verse 7 one of the Ten Commandments says this thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain go back turn back over to Matthew I want you to go to Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 Matthew 12 28 God's name is definitely not kept hallowed or holy uh, in this in this uh, generation that we're in now in today's world Years ago, though, people, even people that were not Christians, they had respect for the church. They had respect for God, and they wouldn't use God's name, at least, at least not around Christians, not around people that they knew would offend. They know his name's holy, but not anymore, not today. They don't care about his name. They've lost the fear of God. They've lost the reference for God. The prayer of Jesus said then goes on to say, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Now, there's been a lot of discussions, and, and I've heard people talking about before, uh, about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And, and they feel like there's different things, that one of them is, is from in heaven and one of them is on earth. But I, I can tell you this, if you study it out, you'll find that in the Bible, they're used interchangeably. You'll have the same, uh, within, within the different uh, 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 gospels, you'll have the same things, and it'll end up saying the, the uh, kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So I, I think they're the same thing. Now I will say this, that they can refer to a couple of, of, of things, uh, a couple of different things. And one of them is that definitely it's heaven. They're definitely referring to heaven sometimes when they say the kingdom of God and when they say the kingdom of heaven. They're definitely talking about up there in heaven. But the other thing is that it's the preaching of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, while he's here on this earth. And I'll show you this. Mark 1, 14 and 15 says, Now after this, John was put into prison. Jesus came in, into Galilee, Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. That's when Jesus was on earth. He said the kingdom of God was at hand. It was near to you. He said, Repent and believe the gospel. Then Jesus tells you this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Matthew 12, 28 says, But I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. But if, let me, let me back up here and say, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. They were accusing Je uh, Jesus of casting out devils by Beelzebub, prince of devils. And you can read and find out that that is the only sin you can't be forgiven of is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, calling the Holy Spirit a devil. 
But if you believe the Holy Spirit's a devil, you ain't going to want to get saved any, anyway, are you? You won't have nothing to do with salvation. Go ahead and turn on over to James. James chapter uh, 4, verse 13. James 4, 13. James 4, 13. The next line in Jesus' prayer says, Thou will be done in earth as it is in heaven. There's no doubt that God's perfect will is carried out in heaven. There's no doubt about that. The holy angels do what he's, what he's done. All the created beings will certainly follow God's orders and commands exactly as he tells them, and, and, he, and he, they go exactly where God sends them. Now, there may have been a time when Satan and his angels were disobedient to God and didn't do God's will, but then they were cast out of heaven. Why? So that there will be no sin in heaven. The Bible says there will be no sin in heaven, none whatsoever. So they were cast down the earth. Now, there's a lot of people in this earth that don't do the will of God. A lot of pride in men's heart. And you know, here's the thing. A lot of us, most of us do this. We believe that we have all the time, that we want all the resources that we want. We make plans. We make plans all the time without a thought of tomorrow. We'll say with confidence, with confidence that we'll, we'll wake up in the morning, we'll go do this, we'll go do that. We make plans. We go to work, we go on vacation. We make plans months ahead and years ahead sometimes, don't we? But you know, one, one of these days it'll all come crashing down. It says this in James, uh, James chapter, uh, what did I tell you? Chapter 4, verse 13. James chapter 4, verse 13 says, uh, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, or tomorrow, yeah, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. The Here's the key right here. Here's the key. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will. That's a big difference, ain't it? Turn over to James 2.15. Now, we're subject to God's will, uh, for sure we know this, because the Bible tells us that in him we live and move and have our being. Without God, we're nothing. We have nothing. The will of God is that we don't live any longer, then we don't live any longer. We should always pray just as Jesus did, thy will be done, not mine, but thy will be done. After this, the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. This is real relevant here. Uh, especially everybody don't have their we have to have food don't we humans have to have food we have to have drink most of us eat three meals a day some people more some people less uh, but we do that we have to we have to do that we understand that we need a certain amount of food a certain amount of calories to stay alive in this earthly body this tabernacle that we dwell in while we're here while we're here on earth uh, but there are those in this world today now why I think it's relevant, why I say it's relevant today, what about those people down there uh, in, in the, the, the places where the, the, the rains, the floods, and the winds hit, tore their places down, poured everything they had down, and, and somebody said they're just wandering around there. They might be hungry. They might be looking for their daily bread. They might be looking for something to drink. They not have it. It's not a sure thing that we will always have food to eat every day. It's not a sure thing. Drought can cause famines, and that causes uh, uh, food shortages. The government can make policies sometimes that cause people to be in need of food. There are places in the world that they have more people than they have resources or the manufacturer even grow the food to feed all the people. In this day right now, in this day and time, it's estimated that 25,000 people a day die of hunger. In America, they say around 650 people, mostly older adults, die of malnutrition. The Bible tells us in James, if, you're hung, if somebody's hungry, feed them. If you're hungry, feed them. James 2, uh, turn over to James 2, uh, 15. James 2, 15 should just be a page over in your book. 2, 15. It says this, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? 
Doesn't profit anything. Doesn't help anything, does it? And don't fill your belly if somebody tells you, be filled. Don't warm me up if somebody says, be warm. I mean, it helps people's conscience sometimes maybe to say, we ought to give to that or you ought to give to that. You know, maybe they feel like they're doing something there. But if you don't actually do that, you don't actually do anything. You absolutely do nothing. Go back over to, to Matthew again. Matthew chapter 18, verse 32. Uh, the Bible goes on to say in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive our debtors. Jesus taught his disciples many principles and many doctrines. He taught them many things, and we, and we now benefit from all that by reading in the Bible. That's, we benefit, we have that benefit now of that from the teachings. If we'll read and we'll study the Bible, uh, because it's a record of those teachings, of those discourse, discourses that, Bible, uh, that Jesus had with his disciples and with the multitudes of the Jews, of the people that followed him. Jesus told a parable. He told a parable about a king. And, and this king, uh, one of his servants owed him money, a lot of money. Owed him a lot of money. And the king called the man and asked for those 10,000 talents, which was a tremendous amount of money, more than most people could pay in their lifetime. And he owed it, he, he, said, he said, pay it. And that was just a huge amount of money. That man couldn't pay it. And since the man didn't have such a large sum of money, according to the law, he was to be sold. His wife and his children were to be sold uh, to pay for that debt. But the man fell down before the king. He fell down and he begged him. He said, give me, just have patience and I'll pay you all that I can. And the king had, had sympathy for him. He had compassion on him. And he forgave the man that whole debt, that whole big, huge, gigantic death. He, 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 he forgave him. Now this man went out. And there was a, one of his fellow servants, uh, you know, a, a fellow of his, on the same level, a peer of his, that owed him some money. Now this man owed him a hundred pence. And that's a fair amount of money. But it was a tiny, tiny amount compared to what that man had owed the king. And, and he wouldn't show that man. He wouldn't show that man uh, compassion. Instead of doing that, he grabbed him by the throat. And he said, pay me what thou owest me. And the man said, I don't have it. I don't have it. And he fell down. He begged the man, forgive me. But the man wouldn't. The man had him put in prison until he was able to pay. And uh, uh, when that king found out about that, he was very, very upset. He was very mad about that. In Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 32 down to 35, it says this. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses. That's important to God. Go ahead and turn on over to uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Dexter and Dale, come on up. The story was no doubt, as we just read that, about Jesus, how he forgave us of our sins and all that we did, and he gave us life eternally, life everlasting. And how that we should forgive our brothers and sisters because the debt that, we, that they owe us is far, far less than what we owe God. The Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer ends up with this, and it's Jesus telling us to ask God and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now we know that the Bible says that God tempts no man, but God doesn't tempt us to do sin. But Satan does, Satan does, and the Bible tells us that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So God's greater than Satan is. He's greater than the influence. God's influence is greater. But you know what? God's infinitely more, more powerful. But we have that option. We have that option to allow Satan's devices on us. We have that power to do that. And sadly enough, we do it a lot of times. We let him have his way. Instead of letting the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, lead us into righteousness... We let Satan lead us into sinfulness. We do that. Ephesians 6, 11 tells us, Put on the whole, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So God gives us the tools we need. Not his fault if we don't use them. We got the Bible, and the Bible tells us what we need to do. The Bible shows us what we need to do. But let me tell you this. Let me just start right here with this. If you're not saved, you have no defense against the devil. You're one of his children. He has those fiery darts that he throws at you. And he'll throw them at you. 
You know, he even tries to do it with, with Christians. But if you're not a Christian, you're, you're susceptible to everything that he throws at you. And you know what? You'll have no answer. You'll have no answer when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at that white throne judgment. And he asks you, why did you never accept that free gift of salvation that I offered you? He might show you his hands, just like he did Thomas. He might say, put your fingers in here. Thrust your hand into my side. He may do that. And he say, I died for you. I died for your sins. Why didn't you accept it? Why didn't you just believe that? You don't want to go to hell. If you, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell. You'll spend eternity in torment. And that's the Bible. That's not me speaking. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. And they make it very, very, very clear when Jesus Christ said, if you die in your sins... Where I am, you cannot come. You know, Jesus Christ will say one of two things for you. And, and you know, when, when I talk about this, I always go back to, I, went, I used to go to the, old, to the boys' home with Dave, uh, Preacher Dave, and he was talking one time about this, and when he got done and he was going to do his, uh, his altar call there, and he, he said these words. I mean, everybody's heard them lots of times. I've said them lots of times. But he said that you'll stand before God if you're not saved, and he'll look at that, and he'll, and he'll ask the angel, is his name in that book? And he'll, he'll look through that, and he'll say, it's not there, Lord. He'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And you know, some of the guys there said, whoa. You know, that hit home with him right then. Yes, sir. It ought to hit home with you every time if you're not saved. Absolutely. Because he's going to tell you. He's either going to say, welcome, uh, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Welcome to the joy of the Lord, or enter into the joy of the Lord. Or if you're not, he's going to tell you, I never knew you. And he's going to be cast out. You're going to be cast out into outer darkness, where there's gnashing of teeth for pain. It's darkness, but it's flames. It's hot. And it's, not hot that'll, it's not hot like a burn that eventually cools off and don't hurt anymore, but it's, it is pain that'll last forever and ever. Never with any kind of reprieve. Not, never with, is it going to rele release up. Never is it going to let up. It's, it is torment forever. That, that rich man in Luke 16, I think it is, 2,000 years ago or more, and he's still there. He's still in pain. If, if his brothers, if his five brothers didn't get saved, they're there right there with him. Not celebrating anything, not having a good time, not like that song Highway to Hell said, going down party time, my friends are going to be there, there ain't going to be no party time. Won't be no party time, there'll be no party time then, it'll be torment forever. It'll be torment forever. Here in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, and, and Jesus Christ made this so clear to you, so easy, all you got to do is just follow this. If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus Christ, do what this thing, this simple thing that it tells you to do here. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That don't sound like too tough. It don't sound like too hard to do. Because he goes on to say this, For with the heart, that's your own heart, man believeth unto righteousness. We're not righteous on our own. There's none righteous, no, not one. But with Jesus Christ, we can have some righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made under on the salvation. It goes on to say this in verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, any of you. My brother Joe had a hard time getting that. He had a hard time understanding that. He said, I don't want to be, and he told me this specifically, I don't want to be one of those kinds of people that say I'm saved and then go right back and do some of the same things that I did before. And I tried so hard to get him to understand. And somebody eventually did. But I tried so hard to get him to understand. It's not how good you are, how bad you were, or how bad you'll be. It's how good Jesus Christ was. Amen. It's how good, uh, how good he was, that he was sinless, and that he did all those great things for you, that he died for you. He gave up riches in heaven, came down here to be humiliated, to be beaten, to be crucified, to be killed for your sin. If you're able to, go ahead and stand up. If you're not, you can remain, be remain standing. But these gentlemen here are going to sing a song of invitation. If God's spoken to you, come on up here and we will do whatever we can to help you out. If you want us to give you that gospel a little more plainly, we'll do that. If you want us to expound on it a little bit, we'll do that. 
If you want to just, if you want to just uh, 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 talk about how, how good God is, we'll accept that. Amen. If you want to rededicate yourself, we'll do that. We'll help you with that. We'll do whatever we can do as we sing. Dale releases in prayer here in a moment. You're free to go. We'd ask you to come up and shake hands with us. Have an old time handshake with us. Say it every time, folks, but it's going to happen. One of these times we ain't going to be able to do that anymore. One of those times we're going to have to meet around the throne of God if we see each other again. So come on up here, Dale, and you can, uh, you can say a prayer for us if you would. Let's, let's bow our heads with you. <coughs> Heavenly Father, God, once again, we just want to thank you, Lord, for what we've heard here today. We thank you for the way you used Brother Randall on expounding on the word today, Lord. And God, we know that you do still have a name above all names, and we do love that name, Lord, and we love you, and we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, and his righteousness through his righteousness, so that we could have a right to that tree of life, Lord. If we'll only ask, if we'll only believe, and we'll ask him to save our souls, he'll do it. He said, I, I'm going to kick any of you out. And we thank you for that, Lord. It's simple, it's easy, it's, it's plain. I don't know how it could get much plainer, Lord. So I just pray that if there is anyone here that don't understand that, Lord, that you would impress it upon their heart, either today or down through the week, before it's everlasting too late, Lord so that they can come to know you as their own personal Savior. And we'll thank you for that, Lord. Thank you once again, God, for your presence here today. The Spirit uh, was definitely here, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that we still have a little church that we can come to here and, and worship you in spirit and truth and, and read from this good old King James Bible. Thank you for the way that you preserved it and kept it all down through you the years, Lord. And, and I know your promises. You said heaven and earth would pass away, and my word would never pass away. Lord, we're so thankful for that, that we have that word, that we can come to know you in, in a very close and personal way through yeah. that word. Thank you once again, God, for the good time we had today, for each and every one that you sent out here today. Lord, we pray as we release now that you'll watch over us as we travel the highways and go to our little homes here on this earth. And Father, we pray that you'll just help us to... Uh, Shed that light amongst our, uh, our brothers, maybe someone that don't know you this week. And as I said earlier, Lord, help us to live each day in the earnest expectation of knowing, Lord, that you are coming back again. And maybe that will make a difference, Lord, and help us to walk a little straighter path and do a little more for you this week than we did last week. Father, we ask all these blessings in Jesus' name, and amen. There's a crowd for those that love the appearing of it.